Thanks, everybody, for coming. If you're, like, way in the back, you can scooch up. It's okay. I won't bite. I promise. <laughs> sure. You have five minutes. Quietly eat the bag of chips. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. We're good. This is a super cardio. This is a Sennheiser MKH 50. <laughs> I just had it in my bag from a gig that I did. I was trying to think of a way to record this with, uh, let's turn down the mic just a little bit. Oh yeah, totally, man. I have like, I have, I won't say hundreds, but like we're definitely in the, in like the high 80s. Do I have, have like you call one the no, I do not. <laughs> Those are, the, those are the things, like if you're going to get into audio, hey, quick tip, if you're going to get into audio, don't invest in things like plugins, because they're worthless. Like once something breaks, like once, um, once like all of a sudden you're on M1 Max and like the plugin manufacturer's like, yeah, we don't care, we're not going to make it work, then you've just wasted all of that money, where things like microphones, they always maintain their value, and you can always get rid of them if you go out of business or whatever. And things like uh, hard, you know, gear to some extent, but definitely microphones are a valid investment. But plugins, not so much. And I have a lot. Like I have like like three thousand plugins, and I use like six of them on a regular basis. So I know what I speak of. They were really cool when I was twenty, because there's no such thing as everything was like hard, you know, hardware, and it was like, oh my god, it's all software now. It's so it's always going to be this way, and now everybody wants to buy hardware again. So. You have to, you don't have, you don't have to pay a prescription, a prescription, a subscription. Yes, absolutely. Everything is a subscription now. It's annoying. <laughs> you never know. You never know. So we have two minutes. So while I'm here, I might as well start teaching a little bit, even though. I won't start teaching the thing, because that would be mean. But just so you know what I'm doing here, so I have threatened to put things on YouTube for like, I don't know, five, six years now, however I started, and I have this fear. So I decided the best way to, to not be scared is to just film the panel. So I'm filming the panel over there. They're filming it too, but I'm filming it. And then I'm thinking, well, how am I going to get, you know, because I can't just have the microphone on my camera, because I don't even know what that sounds like. So I'm thinking, like, what am I going to do? Well, I could dismantle their stuff and plug it into my stuff. And then I decide, you know what? I'm just going to have a microphone. So I'm running a microphone here into a Zoom F6. The, Zoom, the reason I picked the Zoom F6, and I'll try not to, and I forgot a pop filter, by the way. Um, the reason why I chose the F6 was because it uses time code, and you can hook up a Bluetooth module that will both sync with the time code in here and the time code on the Atomos recorder. So now they're synced. So now I can just go upstairs and like put it together and chuck it on YouTube. It's really simple. Um, so I'm running my, my mic into the Zoom. I'm using its preamp. And I'm also running the computer into the Zoom and using their, the preamps there. And then that is coming out their line level into their mixer. And that mixer is then being streamed, well, to the, to the speakers, but it's also being streamed using their camera over there. So they're getting everything that I'm doing, and, uh, but it's all coming out of my device. And so that's kind of important because that sort of shows you a little bit of the kind of things that you can do with signal flow and how you can choose and mix, mix and match your equipment. But here it is. It is 4 o'clock. And welcome to the panel. This is Recording Better Voiceovers. This is like year four in a row for this panel, which is awesome because people are still coming. They even upped our room size, which is awesome. And it's live streaming, which is even better. So. Well, I'm going to do this a little differently than I've done it before. So usually I come in and I just sort of give you like a lecture and then we ask some questions. But I want, we always tend to have so many questions that I want this to be 
not only am I going to teach, but any questions you have, let's just let's just do it, right? It's sort of like an ask me anything, but not, but we'll have some structure too, okay? But the biggest thing here is everybody. How many people in this room have a podcast? Okay. So when I first did this, no one raised their hand, and now everybody does, right? I remember when podcasts weren't cool, and they're like, people are like, you have a podcast? What is, what is that even, right? We don't even have the pods anymore for the cast. Like, you, it's crazy. Um, how many people here are voiceover actors or actresses? Awesome. How many people just want to record other people doing stuff? Excellent. If you didn't raise your hand, like, wh why are you here? Yeah. I'm just wondering. Fantastic. Okay. Excellent. Future stuff. Learning stuff is cool. Excellent. Well, my name is Dr. Jonathan Cressy. Um, I am out of Little Rock, Arkansas now, but I used to live in Maryland, and I am a, at the moment, a adjunct professor at Frederick Community College, um, remotely, basically. I come up and do sessions for them, um, and... Uh, but I run my own business, and my business is Fundamental Sounds, and Fundamental Sounds is a record label, and it is a audio production company where we work with young talent and just local artists and community artists to try to get their music out, because we all know that it can be expensive to put music out, and we don't get a whole lot of return on investment when it comes to music. So this is, it, it, it's a really cool, like, educational thing that I try to run. So we're going to talk about how to record better voiceovers, or basically how to record your podcasts or maybe your Twitch streams. That's something that has become interesting. Um, there, I have another panel uh, on Saturday, and I worked with a D&D &D group called Legends of Avantress, and they, um, they have a Twitch stream, and they are a YouTube channel, and they do all this stuff, and they make games, and it's a D&D &D thing. And they called me up after watching this panel, in 2019, they called me up in 2023 and said, hey, we need help with audio. And so we built an entire rig for them where they have seven people on this D&D &D stream all at the same time. And that's, that, that, um, that lecture will be on Saturday and you'll get to meet them or some of them because I guess one of them that wanted to come forgot to buy his badge. Oh, uh, well, can't come now. <laughs> can't get in. So anyway, um, we'll meet them and talk about that and why we chose the equipment. But that sort of dovetails into everything I'm talking about this week. I'm talking about choices, like how do we choose what equipment to use? How do we choose what to buy? Because I'm getting tired of the first thing everybody talks about is define your budget. No, the first thing you need to talk about is what the heck are you doing? right? That's the first thing. What am I trying to record, right? When I got into it, I probably would have never bought this microphone when I first started recording because I'm a classical trumpet player and I made money making audition tapes for people. This is not a great microphone for that, okay? This is a great microphone for voiceover work and to sit in a panel room. This is fantastic, but why is it a good microphone for that? And we're going to talk about that. Why are the different choices? And then also, where are the places that you might be able to upgrade your system or to upgrade your technique to get better sound? Because when it comes down to it, bad audio is bad. Right? My wife is a pediatric neurologist in Arkansas, and um, she went to a... Uh, a seminar or whatever you call it, their, their, their convention, their neurologist convention, and they, and they did a podcasting thing because all the doctors, all these professionals are starting to get into podcasting, and the guy actually said that audio doesn't matter. Like, don't worry about it. And I'm like, but it's a podcast. Like, audio is the only thing that matters, right? I mean, like, yeah, your content. I mean, but let, let's admit it. How many of us listen to podcasts that the content is somewhat suspect? Right? Like everybody does. It's okay. You know, it's fine. It's like a thing. We, it's entertainment. And that's, that's the thing. Audio is, is really important. And it's something that's a little scary for me as an educator and as a, uh, a professional in this field is we work really hard. Like that camera right there that I'm saying hello to is a 4K camera. We are recording in 4K ProRes RAW, whatever that means. And, and like we're like obsessed with video quality, right? Everybody's like, yeah, audio, whatever, like 64 kbps mp3, that's fine. Don't worry about it, right? So 
good audio is, and that's because good audio is invisible, right? If it's something is good and it's not distracting, then like if I'm not doing this the whole time, then that's gonna sound great on the Twitch stream. Um, if I'm not doing that all the time, then you're not even gonna notice it. And, I, and, and the more people put podcasts on YouTube, I don't personally necessarily listen to podcasts on the podcast app, but like I'll have a YouTube stream up or something and I'll listen to it. And I can actually watch the progression because it'll be like unlistenable and then it'll be like, oh, maybe they figured it a little bit out. And then like one guy is really good and the other guy is still trash because he's like recording in a different place and, and has a different budget. And all of, this, all of these different things happen and finally they get to a point where it's all fine. And then, and then you just forget about it. Then it's like, okay. So we need to really think about what makes good audio. The other thing is, and, and there aren't any solutions. Okay, there are only trade-offs because it depends on what you're doing. Like, who are you recording? What are you recording? All of those things are incredibly important to know when you are starting this business. Then you have um, what, then you can start thinking about, okay, well, well if we're going to think about budget, what, what things are, are worth spending money on, what things aren't worth spending on. So we have all of these things and they're all trade-offs because I knew a guy, like the, my mentor, the person who taught me how to record, used to, used to sit in class and say, and say, if I had a Mr. Microphone, I'd be able to record better than you. Now, most of us don't know what a Mr. Microphone is, but when I was a kid, that was the microphone that like wirelessly went to your, your, your cassette deck like your boom box and you could like sing along and karaoke and record stuff and that was cool that was like the height of personal home recording when i was a child and so he he would say that and he was probably right because he understood what avery mike could do and what it couldn't do and then he would tailor it to whatever he would tailor his technique to that so there are ways to get around budget right there's ways that we can get around that but you have to know where things are. So the first thing you have to think about is how do we even set things up? And that's where we start with the recording jam. We're gonna talk more about this in my next panel tomorrow. But basically, these are the four things that you need if you're going to make a podcast, other than like figuring out how to get it on the internet, right? You need a microphone, which is called a transducer, which basically takes acoustic energy and turns it into electrical energy. And it's really bad at it. Super bad at it. Like, so, here, I'll do this. this. This will make no sense whatsoever. This is how soft the microphone gets. But now we've got the microphone is coming back, and that's because I'm using a microphone preamp. Okay, and so my microphone preamp raises the level of the output of the microphone so that it can be listenable and heard. Right, so it can be recorded. So microphone preamps, the amp or the inner, and I say amp or interface, and that's because interfaces, what we use to, it, like this is an interface, this little thing is acting as an interface. Um, that aspect of things is, is a, it, it contains the microphone preamp, but they can be separate. So they can be separated out into different parts or they can be one thing. So that's something to, to know. A lot of people talk about, oh, you just need to buy an interface. Well, you have to remember that that interface is gonna have a, a uh, what we call an A to D converter, which converts your analog to digital, and it also has the microphone preamp, preamp in it. You're paying for both of those things. So the cheaper you cheap out on a microphone preamp, the wor or on the interface, the worse the microphone preamp is gonna be. Okay, so. And then, so I can be really embarrassing, guess who didn't press record? It's recording now. <laughs> okay, see, fess up to it. Now, now we'll have a very interesting video, we're all learning. Okay, so these are super uh, interdependent, I hope I spelled that right, super interdependent. Okay, so you can get away with a really cheap microphone if you have a good interface, or I should say a good preamp. You can get away with a really not so great preamp if you have a nice microphone. Now why, you ask, right? That's because cheapness has two problems. When you buy something that is cheap, yeah, maybe it's sound. So that's one of the problems, whatever, we'll skip over it, because 
this is cheap, right? But everybody uses them and they're like the thing. What really is, is they're noisy, okay? Cheap microphones are super noisy. And when you're recording yourself, doesn't matter. But when you're recording seven people, matters. Like big time matters. So for instance, this microphone, this Sennheiser is, uh, and this is not, like I'm not sponsored, but like this, just so you know, don't go out and buy this microphone, it's very expensive. Um, it, has, it has like 12 decibels of self noise. So if you do like the math and you go up to eight, you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood uh, when you add them all together of, what, what is that, uh, eight, like 20-ish? 20, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 decibels of self noise. Okay, when you add decibels, it's logarithmic, it's not, it's not linear. So that's, that's decent. You know, seven of these or eight of these equals one of those in self noise. That's a big deal because now if you've got a 20 decibel self noise mic and you've got eight people talking in a podcast and they're all being added together at the same time, you'll hear in the background and it's not your room. It's not any of those other things. It's the mic. And that's the thing. This sure SM58, right? I think it's SM58. Indeed it is, okay? It is an actual SM58. Um, those are dynamic microphones, and dynamic microphones need tons of gain, okay? So the output of this is like negative 50. The output of this is like negative 60. Okay, so that means that unless you're playing, you're doing something that's really loud, like a cheap preamp, what do you hear? And when there's seven of them, it's bad, right? Super bad. And so we have to make a trade-off. If you're going to say, okay, well, I need seven preamps, so I need an interface that has like seven inputs, eight inputs. No one makes a seven input interface. Eight inputs. Well, I might have to like be less on that. I might have to say, okay, well, I can't spend, you know, four thousand dollars on an interface to get a really good eight-channel interface. So that means you're going to have to spend the money on something that's going to have a little less self noise. Now, one of the problems with cheaper microphones is a lot of them won't measure their self noise, or they say they're really soft, and they're not. Like my good friends at uh, what is they call it, the uh, SE Electronics. Anybody have any SE microphones? No? Okay. They're, they're, I like the way they sound, but boy, are they noisy. And they say, we're the quietest microphones on the, on, on, you know, on the planet. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. You're lying. And that's okay. So it just is what it is. And you have to be careful with that. So it's important when we think about those trade-offs, what are you going to spend your money on, right? Content is content. You can make that up. But the production value. What are you going to do? You can make a podcast from a, a recorder, like this Zoom recorder here, a microphone, and you're good to go, right? This, this unit right here is probably, mm, like with sales, 1100 bucks maybe. And you could do six people. You could talk to each other. Well, six people, then it'd be a lot more money, six microphones. But, I mean, like, you... you you have the ability to, to get into it as long as you have the, uh, the understanding of what spots you can switch up and get rid of. And I haven't even talked about because, like, you could, any computer is going to work. Let's stop with the buying of computers. Like, I like computers a lot. I have lots of computers. But, like, people, you don't need to buy a good computer. I was recording 24-bit, 48 kilohertz audio out of a PowerPC Mac that was like, like 700 megahertz and everything was just fine. So now we've got stuff that's like huge. If all you're doing is recording, you don't need anything powerful, anything will do, okay? I will say this, that if you are streaming on OBS, please don't use the Mac. Uh, I have found that OBS and Mac is garbage. Uh, mainly because it recognizes two of your mic preamps on your interface, but not all eight. Oh no, we can't have that. So yeah, uh, I find OBS Windows is much better. And that's from somebody who doesn't like Windows at all. But there you go. So let's, 
let's look at microphones first, okay? So last year, I had come up with the idea that, you know, you, could, you should use something like a shotgun microphone if you're going to do things. It's going to be great, and it isn't. I didn't lie. I mean, we can, ha we can change our opinions. I'm just saying. I've changed my opinion, okay? So dynamic or condenser, that's the first thing. Dynamic microphones are moving coil microphones, which means they require a ton of power and a ton of volume. Every... Uh, radio station on the planet uses dynamic microphones, except for Howard Stern. I've noticed he uses TLM 103s, which is odd. Condenser microphones, and he's like right up on it, like he's like licking that microphone. It's really weird, but like, so I don't, I don't get that at all. But anyway, most people use dynamic microphones. One because they're they're super robust. You drop it, totally okay. No one cares. Okay? You can smoke. Well, no one smokes anymore. But back in the day, they would smoke in the studio, and it didn't matter. It wouldn't break it. They would drink, and they would drop water on them. It didn't matter. That's why they use dynamic microphones. Okay? SM7B is like the industry standard, but there are other ones that you can get. However, if you get that dynamic microphone, you're going to need an audio interface that has su su sufficient gain to make it loud. Now they make things, they're called FET heads. They're like these little things that you plug into the back of the microphone before you get to the, 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 the Canon plug, the XLR. So the XLR plugs on one side and then you plug that into the microphone. And that uses phantom power that would normally run a condenser microphone to basically add gain to the dynamic microphone and so you can use cheaper interfaces. Um, that works. Okay? I have never heard one that I like. I don't know why. They're supposed to be transparent. They're supposed to not sound like anything. And they swear up and down that they don't. And I've talked to the manufacturers. And they're like, look, it doesn't sound like anything. And I'm like, look, I hear something. Okay? Because, again, I'm a trumpet player. And I record a lot of trumpet players. And so we do a lot of, like, ribbon microphone stuff. And every time I plug one in, it makes that ribbon microphone sound a little worse. And I don't know why. But, again, it's not spoken word. And it's just anecdotal. I have no data. So you can use those to sort of get away with buying a cheaper interface. But you're going to need an interface with a lot of gain to use this. Or you can buy a condenser microphone, which very sensitive. You don't need a really great interface to run it. Problem is, is if you buy a cheaper one and you have more than one person talking, you run into that problem with self-noise. Okay. The next biggest thing you have to look at is directional response, which means at what part, you know, where does it all work? Like, where, where am I going to get the most volume out of this? And this is where I said shotgun microphones were great. Most microphones, polar plots are how you see this. This is a polar plot. Most microphones are condenser, or sorry, condenser, they're cardioids, which look like an upside down heart. Okay? Let me see if I actually have the slide up here of the upside down heart. No, it's the next one. Look at that. The one I recommend is actually called a supercardioid. So a supercardioid, let's look at both of them. That's a supercardioid. It looks like a mushroom, right? And if you look at it, you'll see that the, the, on 90, at 90 degrees, it's much less. Like it doesn't pick up as much audio from 90 degrees. So basically what's happening is it's, it's rejecting sound that is around the microphone for you so you don't have to do anything and this is typically what people use when they're t when they're getting dialogue for um for uh, for video indoors they'll use a super cardioid microphone they call them short shotguns they're not shotguns they're super cardioid microphones okay the reason why we use this is because it will try to eliminate a lot of the room you get what's in front of it. You don't get what's around it, okay? Cardioids are the same way, but no, of course, that's heart there. Cardioids are the same way, but notice how the cardioid picks up a lot more on this and a lot less behind it. So you have to think about that. Are you gonna have people next to you? Or are there people gonna be across the table from you? Do you have anybody in front of you? Because if you have no one, then you can use a cardioid microphone and you're great. But if you've got anybody else in the room, your producer, other talent, whatever, you may want to look at positioning and what mic you might want to get. The shotgun microphone, or we call it a directional, is even better 
at isolating things. Now here's the problem though. So shotgun microphones were developed to work outside. And they work using a tube. So the microphone is like this and then they stick a tube and the tube comes out this way. And what happens is the tube has slits in it. And so from dead on, you get straight to the, the, the diaphragm. From the sides, things have to take a circuitous route to get there. And what happens is it, is it phase cancels. So the waves cancel each other out as they get to the capsule. That's a problem when you're on the indoors because it's great for canceling out wind. But what are the things that we have when we talk indoors? Do we have wind indoors? What do we have indoors? Well, we have air conditioners, but what else? We also have we have reverb, right? Which is us, which means we're phase canceling us. All right, here I'll throw a little bit of shade, just a tiny bit. Okay, so there's a really there's a really um, I guess popular YouTube thing, Critical Role. Anybody know Critical? Right? Have you ever wondered why their audio sounds the way it does? They use shotgun microphones. It doesn't sound good. Is very distracting to me because you know I've had clients who are like hey I want to be we want to be just like them and I listen to it and I'm like you sure you want to be just like that <laughs> like like because my thing is is I like audio that's real like when I hear spoken word I want to hear it as being hey that guy's right next to me or that person's right next to me and it, that makes me comfortable and voice is one of the hardest things to record because we all know what it sounds like right like you know, you could record a trumpet and not be so great at it because, you know, how many of you really know what a trumpet sounds like? I mean, like, really. Like, I know there's probably trumpet players here, but, like, really, like, you've sat in a room with a trumpet player as they played at your head kind of thing. It's like you don't hear that a lot. And so, but we always hear people talking. And so you just, you have to get the voice part right. And you can't do this like, here, I'm going to turn this down. But you get like this, this really low sound. I hate that. That's so weird. Like, why do people record that? That's not real. No one sounds like that. It's like the radio voice or whatever that everybody talks about. Anyway, I digress. But shotgun microphones will actually give you phase cancellations of your own voice, which then makes it sound very veiled. It sounds like this. Sounds weird. And if you listen to people who do that on YouTube, you'll notice that you'll get just a little bit of this. And you can't get rid of that. You can't fix it. Like that's not a fix it in the mix thing. So shotgun microphones are not the best for indoors. Use them if you have them, but don't, I, just don't buy a shotgun if you don't have it already, right? Buy a super cardioid if you're in a room that's super echoey, right? Because what's gonna happen, like in here, like we'll hear what this sounds like. Maybe it'll sound good, maybe it won't, I don't know, but like, I'm assuming that we're going to have very little echo in this room, in, in this recording, because we're using a super cardioid microphone. Okay? You can get away with a cardioid, like voiceover artists out there, cardioids are fine. Use those, because usually you're going to be in some place that is acoustically treated to some extent. And if you're not, like, do your voiceover into a closet or something, okay? Not in the closet, but out of, like, put the mic in the closet, do it that way. But that way, you know, the cardio just gets rid of some of the echo, and it'll get rid of a lot of the stuff around the room. But if there's only one person, then you don't have to worry about a whole lot of the echoing. Okay, but the concept of using a, there we go, super cardioid microphone is good. Use those. Now, most microphones are cardioids, so get it. I don't know if there's any hypercardioids. I mean, they make them, obviously, or this wouldn't be here, but like, you don't really see hypercardioid microphones as, hey, we want those, right? It's more about the supercardioid and the cardioid, okay? But stay away from the shotgun microphones if you're indoors. If you're outdoors, buy a shotgun microphone. Don't buy that, because it'll be like, <laughs> right? It'll be really bad, okay? That scared everybody on Twitch, too. Okay, <laughs> this is the last time they're going to put me in this room. All right, <laughs> lastly, with microphones, frequency response is a big thing. You ask yourself how you're going to know what a mic sounds like before you buy it. You look at these, the frequency plots. 
And it won't tell you exactly what it sounds like, but it's going to give you a rough estimate of what it's going to sound like. This is another thing with the whole cheap microphone, not cheap microphone, okay? Um, some cheap microphones don't have a great... Uh, so what they do is they copy the old ones. So all of the patents are gone, basically. Well, I don't know if that's true. I'm just going to say that. That's probably 80% bullshit. Sorry, I cursed. 80% BS. But the patents are gone, and so people are looking at the Neumann microphones or the Sheps microphones, and they're like, hey, I can build that circuit. Like, you could. Like, if you can solder, you can make a microphone. It's not hard. And so, in fact, microphoneparts.com is super cool. You can buy kits, and you can solder your own microphones together, which is awesome. But you, you have that circuit, and they make that circuit. Well, that circuit was made to be paired with a very particular capsule that did a very specific thing in frequency response. That's where the cheap microphones, they're like, whatever. Like, just throw whatever you got in there, in there, and it tends to make them incredibly bright because they'll pair a very bright circuit with a really bright microphone capsule. Whereas, like Neumann, when they made the U87, they have a very bright capsule, but it's paired with a, a circuit that has a built-in um, High pass or low pass filter in it, so it sort of mitigates it and it gives it a particular sound. But that's where the cheap microphones mess up. So you have to look at this. This is the Shure SM7B, and you look at it, and boy, does it look not so great. Okay, but this is what makes it a pretty decent uh, microphone for uh, voiceover, not voiceover work, but like radio work and things like that. And it's because you'll notice that it doesn't pick up a lot of things in the low end. Right? Because we're doing voice. There is no low end. Right? I know I don't have a very low, low voice, but I, gu I guarantee you that, like, the lowest bass, whatever that's on YouTube that are doing, like, the Viking songs or whatever, like, the lowest dude doing that probably doesn't have anything below, I would say, 90 hertz at best. Like, I just, like, we're talking, like, like bass trombones have like their lowest note is like 60 hertz or something. So normal speaking voices don't really go below 100. And a male voice is usually like at 120. And a female voice is like at 145, 150 hertz is where they stop with their stuff. So basically, if you get a microphone that rolls all of that off, all that you're rolling off is that, the rumble of the room, or somebody walking on the floor, or an air conditioner in another room that's rumbling the house. All of that low frequency information is just garbage, so we get rid of it. And this microphone does it automatically. Auto magically gets rid of it, it's not even there, it doesn't record it. Now, it might not be the best if you were recording, I don't know, a bass trombone, because then you're losing stuff, or like if you want like a full range Bosendorfer piano that has like an octave below what normal pianos have, then you probably want a different microphone. You'll also notice at the top end where we have the speaking voice, so up around, um, <coughs> pardon me, one kilohertz and higher, you start to see these little bumps, right? And those bumps are in places where, where we have sibilance, which is not great, but also where we have mouth noises. And what that does is it makes things more intelligible right? You can actually hear someone because you're hearing their consonances. So we need a little bit of that bump up there. That's why the U87 and the Neumann microphones in general are very popular in voiceover. It's because they were built. Here's, here's a really cool thing to think about. They were built, and again, I, I, this is something that I have I don't have personal, like I looked, I looked this up in a book, or I talked to the person who designed the microphone. But what they were doing is they were designing a microphone to be used in a hall to record people, right? The further away you get from someone, the less high frequencies you have. So they actually built their microphone in with a little bump, right? Up at 10 kilohertz, there's this bump. They call it the Neumann bump. It's in every, almost all of their microphones have it, right? That was meant to put a microphone further away from the stage and you would get a balance. Well, what people started doing was they started using them close in on voices, and it just happens to be in the perfect spot for, for consonances. So you can really hear stuff. It makes things really sparkle and do things like that. And 
<clears throat> that's why they're very popular. So if you see something like that where it's got a bump up in the high register, that won't necessarily be bad. That might be great because it'll really help with your voice. It might not help if you're a trumpet player because it'll make you sound bright and nasty, but it'll help if you're a singer, right? Or if you're uh, a, just a normal spoken word person, okay? Here's one, here's a CAD E100. This is actually a relatively cheap mic. It's the CAD um, with a circle. The label is a circle, not an oval. Circle, not oval. Okay, the circle one is from the 80s, well, like late 80s, early 90s, and it's very flat. And you can, you can cut the low end with a, a filter, and they work really good too, but it's going to be for someone that you might not want that consonance to it because it doesn't have the bump up there. Any questions about this so far? Any ideas, thoughts? Yes? Ooh, that's a good one. So, technically speaking, when something has a lot of high harmonics, so like a flute or uh, a harp or things like that, they tend to be bright. So they're going to sound um, more brittle and be fatiguing to the ears. When something is dark, <clears throat> it has more low harmonics. So when something, like my voice right now, actually has probably no middle because I'm getting over a cold. So you have this low growl, so that's more of a dark, but you also have some of the graveliness, which is sort of the brightness. So bright is more brittle and dark is more um, solid sounding. I know that probably doesn't help, but it's, it's like a, it's a metaphor. Trying to think of what, what we could do. Have you ever listened to Bob Marley? Any of Bob Marley and the Whalers? Anybody? Yeah? They're really bright. Like that's super bright. I should have looked that up, but then we'd really get into copyright protection. But it has to do with it has to do with the brittleness of it. And you'll hear like I'm trying to think of a anybody have a good example of what would be bright? Like today, or not today, like on the Twitch stream today in the hotel room, they had like a bunch of flute players playing in the atrium. It's a re, like a recast of something that happened last year. And like there was like a piccolo and that was really bright. Like it was like super bright. And so that would be like an interesting way to think of it instrument wise. Like if you go on the internet and listen to like piccolo or flute or oboe, you'll hear like upper these upper sounds that make it more bright. Consonances are very bright too. So this is like if I'm, if I'm being very, um, like the, the mouth sounds that you hear in my mouth, that is the brightness of it, where you can actually hear what I'm, understand, what I'm saying. I have to think about that. That's a very good question. Yeah, but like how do you, ex how do you describe that to someone metaphorically? Because you're right, that's exactly what it is. The ear is mostly hearing high pitch percussive or complement voices. Right. But still, we need the metaphor. Because, <laughs> yes? I would just think I would say it's almost the verge of wanting to turn something down. And it's the space of almost tinny. Yeah, that's a, good word. that's a good word for it. Tinny. And like it's it's just it, it it's so loud like not loud but it's just grating, right? Like playing music on. Do you have a, a cell phone? Yeah. So like if like after the panel, put a, put something on your your cell phone speaker and listen to it. That's bright because your cell phone speaker literally can't reproduce lower frequencies. It's not possible. So anything you hear with that would be considered bright. Okay. Yeah, how do you even describe it as well in where you feel where you want to start turning it down? If something's super bassy or low or dark, you feel it more in like your chest or anything like that, but if it's loud and it's a bright, you can feel it more in your head. Yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it too. Right. 
Okay. <laughs> right. So, so what they, so what some people have said, because um, they're, I guess, off camera, is is that um, we have, when we hear something that is bassy, something that is that that is dark, we're going to feel it in our chests. We're going to feel it in our bodies. And as it gets brighter, it's going to get closer to our head. And if you have two pieces of mu one piece of music, and you listen to it on a full range system, it might get that feeling in your chest, but then when you listen to it on your cell phone, it's missing, right? You'll, you're missing something. And that would be something to, to listen to. Just listen to any music on your cell phone, and that's going to be bright. And then listen to it like on headphones, and you'll hear the difference. Like even the headphones that came with your, your uh, cell phone, you'll be able to hear the difference. All right. Let me skip that. Amper interface. Oh, we already did that. Production. So. Some of the things that are going to make your, make your thing better, you, you, you should get a pop filter, but don't buy one, right? So this is from We Are the World back in the 80s. That, my friend, is Bruce Springsteen, my friends, right? And if it's good enough for him to sing into pantyhose, it is good enough for you. Because that's what that is. That, my friends, is a coat hanger with pantyhose on it. And that is what we used to use all the time until some marketing genius thought it would be really good to market pop filters, okay? Um, I recommend uh, getting, you can go to Walmart or Joanne Fabrics or whatever and buy embroidery rings, wooden or plastic. Plastics are cool because they come in different colors. And then you go to Walmart and you buy queen size pantyhose and then you you can like put two layers if you want or whatever, and you put them in the inner ring and you just shove them together, screw it down, cut the edge around, and, or don't, it doesn't matter. And then you can actually use like these, these microphone clips and you can actually put a screw in there and it'll, it'll screw into the uh, embroidery ring and then you can just mount that on a stand and put it in front of your microphone. And what it does, obviously, I don't have one, so I'm not going to demonstrate what a pop filter does because I can't. Um, also, socks work, too. Um, I have made people uh, sing into socks before, and, yeah, they were worn. They, they were the socks off my feet. It was like, here we go. Well, we needed to do something, and it had to get done. So, And nobody was wearing any pantyhose. Otherwise, it would have been pantyhose. But that's the thing. Don't buy them. Just get a coat hanger. Get some pantyhose. Get some gaff tape, wrap it around there, and, and, and go that route, okay? It's cheap. It's plentiful. Like, you can get them, and once some, like, like, in the era of COVID or no one wants to be sick, right, you can throw it out and not be like, oh, my God, I'm just throwing out $50 worth of pop filter or whatever. And, like, I don't even know if those metal mesh pop filters even work. Like, those ones that, that come with, like, the super fancy microphones or whatever. Like, they're like sieves, I guess, right? Like, they're, they're off of, like, a, they're like a strainer that they just mounted in front. I just don't think it works, right? Because the whole point is what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent the peas. You can also prevent the peas like what I'm doing right now, which is I know I'm not necessarily talking on this side of the room because that's where the microphone is. But what I'm doing is I'm not, I'm, I'm putting the microphone away from my mouth. It's pointed at my mouth, right? But it's below my mouth, it's at my chin. And now I don't have any peas. There's no peas, no problem with popping, right? I can go pop, 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 and not a big deal. Because I'm not in, and if you ever watch, have you ever gone on YouTube and watched like the making of some anime or something and they've got the voice actors? Where's the microphone? Well, sometimes, well, where, I, sometimes it's there, but I, I see more often than not, the microphone is like, like up here. It's like pointed at their nose. Hey, this sounds pretty good, right? And that's because they're putting it away from their mouth where the energy is. It's pointed towards their mouth, but the sound is going this way, right? So you're not going to have any of that popping. And then if someone screams or does something really loud, you won't have anything that you won't be able to fix. So having that ability to move the microphone. Yes? Yeah, that works too. Yeah, so really it's all about where you position microphones. How does that interface with your recommendation of audio versus super hard Okay, so it actually, it can do some very interesting things. So for instance, not only do, um, 
frequency plots come with just the regular plot, but they'll also have usually a polar plot that says, hey, um, if you have certain frequencies, this is what the polar plot's going to look like. And you'll watch the polar plot sort of shrink, okay? I wish I had a picture of this, but it would shrink. And so what will happen is if you move the microphone, you will actually lose certain frequencies, which sometimes are really good, right? Like uh, there are certain microphones that if you point it at something, they have that bump in the high range. But if you do this and you point, you're, you're pointed it straight up, those don't have, like it gets rid of that bump. So they then become flat. They become very transparent. All you did was move it 90 degrees well, in any direction, it doesn't matter, right? So doing this actually changes the way it sounds. And this, so this mic, so my voice probably sounds different now that, you know, if I point, if I point it at my mouth, so now it's at my mouth, you hear there's a lot more resonance. And now when I put it away from my mouth, there's a lot less resonance, and you can understand me a little bit better. So this is something. Or like, hey, you're recording a guitar cabinet? How many people here are electric guitar players? Anybody? Okay. Ever record a guitar cabinet? Yeah, right? What do we always use? What's the microphone everybody uses? For... I mean, I always stick around with whatever I have. I always forget the... Okay. Well, the, the, the like, gold standard, if you want to sound like Led Zeppelin or whatever, is an SM57. Like, bog standard, what everybody uses in general. But they don't just point it at the cabinet. They take the cabinet and they go like this. They point it at 45 degrees to the cabinet because what it does is it actually takes away some of the high frequencies and makes it less harsh. So you can actually move a microphone. So when you buy a microphone and you start using it, don't just stick it in front of the person or in front of yourself. Move it around. Figure it out, right? Also, don't trust the people on YouTube who, who are like, hey, I'm testing out this microphone. Doesn't it sound really good? And... Um, I, because I used to watch it, and then one day I noticed the YouTuber, like, had a lapel mic, and they didn't hide it right, and so, like, as they kind of leaned this way, the lapel mic pointed out, and I'm like, you're not even using the microphone. This is not, that's, that's against the rules. So, that's something, like, being able to point a microphone in a different direction, just like what we've done here. We've already gotten rid of pretty much all of the popping, right? The problem with this, though, is you will get and I won't do it because it's just weird, but you'll get a lot of breathing because my nose, right? It's going to go right down into the microphone. So you've got to kind of play around with where you're putting your microphone. And that's why a lot of people will put them up because you, you won't get the air from your nose and you'll still be able to get the voice. The, and of course, if you're doing video, then you can put it out of the shot, right? So it just looks like you're talking to people. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, are there any cons for pointing it down? Yeah, one, it changes the sound. So if you've picked a microphone that suits a person and it's in front of them and you move it, then it won't suit them anymore necessarily. You will also start emphasizing the room a little bit more because it's further away from the person. So the way you get rid of room noise is you make sure you, the person you're recording or the person you're recording, is the loudest thing. If they're the loudest thing, no one will hear the room, okay? That's why close miking is why we use it, is to isolate people and things. And so you get it further away, and you're in a room with other people, it's going to pick up other people too. Right, or, or you have to sort of play with where you're going to put it. But yes, that, is, that would be one of them. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. When you said hygiene, I was just like, I don't know if you can clean microphones. Because um, that was a COVID thing. Like, people were like, you know, well, can we spray them with disinfectant? And they're like, I don't know. So um, as far as that goes, one, you have to coach them because you're still the producer, right? So you have to be like, hey, man, could you just, like, not move so much? And that would be great. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that that would be where we get the use of a compressor, right? Compressors are used, and we can 
show, I'll show that in a second, but a compressor, which is an outboard piece of gear or a plug-in, is used to prevent things from getting, uh, like it, it evens out your volume, right? So it's loud or it's, you know, it takes the loud and the softs and it evens it out. So if someone's moving, like I'll do it, right? So here I'm talking to like this and then I go like that and I'm, not, and I'm like over here and then I'm like over here and then I'm up here and around and, and it's, my voice is changing, right? And so if I use a compressor, I can actually get it so that it's all even. So radio stations do that a lot. If you've ever noticed in a radio station, they'll just move around and it never sounds like their head has moved from any spot and it's because they've compressed the snot out of it. It's going to level the loudness and it will make it, it won't affect the timbre so much, but it will, it will make it more palatable to the point where you probably won't miss, you won't, you won't notice the timbre so much. Yes. Uh, so I... Sure, if you want, that's great. No one's gotten into the mic. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, so I always hear a lot of professional um, audio editors and masters, people who say that compressors are like the bane of their existence. So I was just wondering, I mean, I've, I've obviously used compression in when I'm mastering something digitally, but I've never used the hardware before. So I was wondering if you could explain that. Okay, well, I mean, a compressor, a plugin and a hardware thing are the same, right? They're exactly the same. All a compressor does is make loud things soft. So when people say that compressors are the bane of the existence, or compressors are the devil or whatever, right? They're, that's a thing. Um, they're, it's, they're, they're talking about the overuse of a compressor. So compressors have, uh, and this could be a lecture on its own, but compressors act on a threshold. So when something gets loud enough, it goes, hey, wait a minute, and it turns it down, okay? That's literally what it does. It doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, but it, it's thinking it, right? And it turns it down. And how fast it turns it down is the attack, and how uh, quickly after it drops below the threshold it comes back is the release. And if, you've, if you don't have the attack and release right, it could be like, it could miss the loud part because the attack is too slow. And then the release is so slow that it actually lowers the soft part and then makes the loud part louder, sound even louder, right? Because what a compressor is doing is altering loudness. So sound has different parts of loudness. Like there's an attack, and there's a sustain, and there's a release, and you can emphasize different parts with it. That's the, the, the creative way of using a compressor. It's also the way that when someone isn't sure of how to use a compressor, they'll do it by accident. And so what you want to do is you want to listen to the compressor and make sure that the loud stuff doesn't sound any softer than the other stuff, so it just seems even. And you can do that by just altering the threshold a little bit, and then maybe you can think, okay, well, is you know a particular like attack or release might change. The other thing is to use simpler compressors. So, like in the old days, we had a compressor called the LA-2A, which was a Tektronix, and it was an optical compressor, and it didn't have a knob. In fact, here I'll just show you. All right, hold on. Stop. Go away. All right, so here's, here's a voiceover. And let's pull up, let's see, LA-2A. Anything, anything? Let's see if I can find it. See, I told you I have a lot of plugins. Don't buy a lot of plugins. And this is it. Okay. All right. So if we look at this. Oh, are you serious? <sighs> Gotta be kidding me. All right. Anyway, I would show you, but I can't. And so it's probably because I don't have an internet connection. That's why. Fantastic. Now let's see if I can get an internet connection real quick. My iPhone, personal hotspot. No one else is allowed to use it. Okay, let's see if it now works. Maybe I have to remove it and put it back. Anyway, what, while I'm just 
figuring out why this isn't working. Okay, it's not gonna work. Anyway, what it is is it only had two knobs. It had gain and it had gain reduction, and that was it. Everything else. So what you did was you like you pushed the gain into the compressor, and then you were like, how much do I want to compress it? And you just twisted the gain, and you just balanced the knobs, and you're like, hey, that sounds good. And, and so with the only the two knobs, it made it really easy to compress things. And it's an optical compressor. So for voice, I use a lot of optical compressors. You can use LA-2As. If you have Logic, it's like the gray Logic compressor. Like they have the different colors, and it's the gray one. It's, that's what's mimicking it. And so, or you can put a compressor at 10 to 1 ratio. That usually mimics optical compressors really well. But yeah, it's, it's the overuse of compressors that bothers people. If you think it sounds fine, then it's probably fine. But you just have to listen to it and go, does this sound like a real voice or does it sound weird? Right? And that's really what you're looking for. Any other questions? I've got 10 minutes. Yes? Come on up. So in our setup, we have two people doing a tech YouTube channel, sometimes retro gaming. Mm -hmm. We have a shotgun mic overhead, maybe about two or three feet overhead. But like the audio is never quite right. So we have a DJI mic, transmitter, and receivers. But with our particular camera, there's feedback. So that's why we aren't using those. Do you have a recommendation for a setup where there's two people talking and maybe a microphone overhead? So what I would do in that situation, how many people you have, two? Two. Two, okay. What I would do is I would get an external recorder, okay? Anything, doesn't matter, a zoom recorder, a cheap zoom recorder, like an, F, an F3 I think has two inputs maybe, or three inputs. And then I would put two microfo one microphone on one person talking and the other microphone on someone else, right? Right now I'm understanding you have one microphone. Yeah, one, one mic. Yeah, that's and if it's a shotgun, basically, like, are you pointing it like in the middle? Yes. So basically, you guys are both on on either side, and you're like in the in the area that we're eliminating. So you're actually like not like you're picking up more of the floor and the reflection of you into the floor or the table or whatever. So what you want is you want to have two microphones, one pointed at each person. Okay, and it could be out of the shot. Like you can get uh, super cardioid, put it up above the shot. Yeah, we have it mounted out of the frame. Yeah, out of the frame, and and then run it to a separate recorder. That way, you can put that recorder on your on your on your camera, and you can take the output, the line out, and go into your camera. And that way, you can have more inputs. Okay. That's what I would do. And you could even use the wireless, you know, the wireless transmitters too. That's fine. But I would definitely have two microphones, one for each person. And then I would position it yourselves so you're not being picked up by either microphone. That makes sense. Does that help? Yeah, super cardioid. Super mic. cardioids, right. Because right now you're using the shotgun microphones. Right. Right, and you're indoors, so it's not going to sound the best. Okay. And I, I think you can get away with, like, like they have Samson C8, maybe? I don't know. They have, like, Samson makes some pretty cheap super cardioids that if you're only doing two people you're going to be fine. It's when you start like amping up the two people, like you're four people, five people, then the noise is going to get a little weird. So okay. you could, you're definitely going to two super cardioid microphones, boom them above and have them pointed like at their nose, like, like this. And then that to the other person. And that way, um, you won't get, you won't have any need for any like real pop filtery kind of stuff because you'll be below it. And it will, uh, you'll be able to pick up both, pe both people very well. Okay, thank yep. you. Cool, yes? What about omnidirectional So an omnidirectional microphone is, is one that picks up audio from all directions equally, okay? So if you were going to do like a round table and you wanted just to have a whole bunch of people in a room, you could use an omnidirectional microphone and it would probably work, but you would also hear the room and there would be no isolation because the microphone would be picking up everything. And that's why we wouldn't use Omnis. But you can, if you want. It's sort of like the aesthetic of your, of your, your podcast or whatever. Yes, sir. Real quick, while he's walking up. The other thing about Omnis is Omnis tend to have the flattest frequency responses. So we use them a lot when we record orchestras. 
because they're super, super flat and they, they're great. But also, if you have a really crappy hall that your orchestra's in, it makes the recording sound very worse, very much worse. Go ahead. Uh, I apologize if you can't explain this in the due time. Mm -hmm. um, so I do some voice acting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what has frustrated me in my recording process is I will sometimes have parts through a line that's, that is quiet, but then gets to like a really loud section. And I, I've tried looking this up and I've stumped myself trying to figure out how to do it. How do you balance out so that the softs are like, if I can explain this properly, mm -hmm. the softs are the same volume as the as the louds. Right. You know okay. I mean? Hmm. <laughs> well, so what you can do, you, there's a couple things you can do, right? So if you're a voice actor, you can produce yourself to some extent, and what you could do is you could make the recording so that your louds don't peak. And then you just do the recording, and then you dump it into your DAW, and you chop it up, and you make the loud you make the loud stuff softer and the soft stuff louder by doing what's called clip gain. Mm. So I do so like I do that sometimes. Okay. The other thing, if you wanted to be more auto magic, is to use a compressor. Okay. The problem with that is like if you have a take where you're really loud, like you're like really loud, and then you back off, then you, your compressor might overreact to the loud part and it might just not sound right. But then there's also the part that you are acting, right? And so part of that's your performance and you don't want to get rid of all of it, otherwise you lose the emotion that you put into those lines. So you have, you have the, um, the compressor that you can use and that's sort of like something that you can do and you can just throw it on and try to adjust it and and I'd be happy to help you do that. Like if you contact me, I can show you. The other thing would be just to chop it up mm. and to do it. So real quick while you're standing there, let's see, hopefully this won't take too long to boot up. But like I have a Pro Tools session where I just edited that voiceover real quick. And I can show you like how many edits it took to get the voiceover right and how I actually altered the, um, the clip gain in everything to even it out. Because that's all a compressor does. I'm just doing it by hand. And that actually sometimes is really um, beneficial uh, because, because you have more of a, uh, a hold on to it. Here we go. So this, oh. so like this is that one thing, mm. okay? And as you, you can't really see it super well, but like that's plus 3 dB, uh, this one's plus 3 dB, this one down here over here is zero. Like, so I actually went in and balanced every single one of these. Okay, so my, sus so my suspicions were correct. It's, it's, it's a manual gig. You know, it's some, I mean, I, you can part. use a compressor too, but yes. Yeah. But like here we have at the end, I don't know if this will play or not. Hold on. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, but that's, my question. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly what, what you need to do. Yes? Um, I was wondering uh, if you do upload the recording to mm -hmm. what, what you need to do. Oh, I'm at here. Well, let me show you that. Yay, good. Thank you. You're so much better at marketing than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Here. Whoa. Go back. Okay. So, I'm at... <clears throat> Fund, fundamental Sounds, and I have a YouTube channel, it's Fundamental Sounds. Yes? Can you minimize the... Oh. <laughs> Where is that coming from? When I switch the input. That's... Wow. Interesting. Because it's not on my screen. That's them. They did it. <laughs> That's <t> <laughs> Sorry, people. I don't know how that happened. That's really weird. Okay. Here, we'll do this. So, number one. Here. Okay, number one. 
if you use that code, right, that QR code, it just takes you to my contact page on my website. And what you can do is you can ask me whatever you want, okay? And you can send me emails. I will answer them. And I always like to get what the, um, the new, like what questions you might have because when I apply for panels at MAGFest, you know, I want to know what to do. And you all need to tell me what to do. Okay, that's the best way to do it. Um, I'm at fundamentalsounds.com. Jonathan at fundamentalsounds.com is my email. And you can go on Twitter, but I, I, I don't know. Like, Twitter's weird. I don't understand it. But um, the, 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 uh, the YouTube channel is fundamentalsounds.com, or it, it should just say fundamental sounds. Okay? Well, thank you very much. It is 5 o'clock, and I should go. So <laughs> thank you.